Good evening, friends, faith, family, and freedom, friends, that is. I'm so glad that you're with us here tonight, or if you're watching it with a replay or watching it on YouTube later, I'm glad you're able to join us. Tonight, we are going to finish up the chapter five in the Gospel of John. Sort of preface this that it was kind of like um, a courtroom scene. If, if you can imagine Jesus being the defense attorney and the Pharisees being the prosecutors, that's pretty much how this plays out, this section of scripture. So last week when we ended, when we ended our session last week, Jesus had just healed the paralyzed man at the pool of Bethesda. That guy went into the temple and the, the Jews are like, what's going on? What do you, why are you carrying your bed? You can go back and listen to that lesson if you want to read more about that. But this week we are getting to get into Jesus' response to them. So I'm going to be reading John 5, 8, 18 to 47. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but he also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father, for whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who, said, who sent him. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear Will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. I call that the opening statement. Now he's going to get into his arguments. If I bear witness of myself, sorry, this is verse 31. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You have sent to John, John the Baptist speaking, and he has borne witness to the truth. Yet I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was the burning and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than John's. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me, and the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his form, but you do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent, him you do not believe. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me, that you may have life. I do not receive honor from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, if another comes in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? Do you think that I shall accuse you to the Father? There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? There's some powerful stuff in here, folks. So let me jump right in. This first part that I call the opening statement, Jesus' opening statement, I can only do what I see my father do. This is like father, like son. It makes perfect sense, doesn't it? He can only do the things that he sees his father doing. And my father shows me everything he does, so I'm doing what my father tells me to do and what my father does and he's shown me. But he is going to show something even greater. Now, what was that? I believe that is the resurrection in one, but the end days that we talked about when we studied the book of Daniel, when Jesus comes back, comes down to earth, returns to earth. Remember the, the, uh, um, the rapture, he comes in the clouds and the believers who are alive then are the only ones who see him and, he, and hear him 
We're the only ones who will hear his voice. But when he returns to earth for the second coming, when he returns to earth, Revelation says, every eye will see him and know that he is who he says he is. To me, that's the greatest thing. And then he's going to defeat all the bad guys. So that's the greatest thing that's going to happen in the future. So I'm not sure if he's talking about that or if he's talking simply about, simply as that, if he's talking about his resurrection. But regardless, war's coming. And then he says the father judges no one, but he gives that over to the son. Now, why does he do that? I don't know about you, but I grew up believing that God was the judge and Jesus was the nice guy. Uh, maybe you did too. But Jesus is doing what the Father does, which means that the Father is also the nice guy and Jesus is also a judge. The Father has given to the Son the authority to judge mankind because not only is he the Son of God, but he is also a son of man. So when it comes time for that great right throne judgment, the one that we're going to be standing at before, the one that everyone will stand before, is Jesus. Now, we won't be judged for our sins like the unsaved are. We're going to be judged according to our works, which will determine our rewards. So the judgment for us is going to be different than the judgment for those who have denied Christ. If that makes any sense. Okay, so we're still in the preamble here in the opening statements. And then he says, as the father raises the dead, the son gives life to whomever he wills. That, I believe, is referring to when we call on the son, he gives us life, eternal life. He even says, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and has passed from death into life. So that the Son gives life to whomever he chooses. That's who he calls, who accept him as their Savior and Lord. Those are the ones whom he calls. If you don't honor the Son, then you don't honor the Father who sent him. Now, that must have really thrown a wrench in the works for these Pharisees. They thought they were all that. They thought they had it all wrapped up with a bow on top and we're going to be in like Flynn, as I've said before, because... We know the scriptures. We are the leaders. We are the pious ones. But Jesus is standing there telling them, if you don't know me, you don't know him. And if you don't know him, you don't know me. We're one and the same. It's a mystery of the, tri of the, the trilogy. <laughs> you're the triune God. But Jesus flat out tells them, if, you're, if you don't honor the son, if you're not honoring me, then you're not honoring God. Even though they, I'm sure they thought, we are honoring God because we're keeping all of the commandments and all of these man-made laws and rules that we made up. We, we just were all that. But Jesus flat out tells them, if you don't honor the Son, you're not honoring the Father. Which brings to mind, there, believe it or not, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but there are people who say, well, yeah, I believe Jesus was a good guy, but, but he wasn't God. He never claimed to be God. Well, if anyone ever says that to you, this is where I would encourage you to guide them to this particular section of scripture in the Gospel of John. Jesus absolutely, without doubt, without fault, without falter, said, I am the same. God, the Father, I am in the Son. I am in submission to the Father. The Father loves me, and he shows me everything he does, so I do what he does. I mean, it couldn't be any more clear than that. So the Jews took so much pride in all the ways that they believed that they were honoring God through all the, the things that they did, the clothing that they wore, and the way that they carried themselves, and their devotion to studying the scripture. Jesus basically says that, that all of that stuff that they're doing is completely useless if they don't honor him. And they must have been completely flabbergasted. And imagine them just, first they're like shocked. I, I'm thinking the stages of grief, actually. They're angry, they don't believe it, and then the anger is what leads them to ultimately kill Jesus. So those who hear my word and believe in him who sent me shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. That is our salvation. When we come to Christ, we shall not come into judgment, 
because Jesus has already paid the price for our sins, past, present, and future. When we come to Christ and we say, Lord, I trust and believe that you are the Son of God, that you paid the price that I couldn't pay, and that you did it for me, and I want to follow you and live my life according to your ways, and I want to become more and more like you every day. That's what it means to be a Christian, right? And Jesus says, when you do that, you will not come into judgment. Then this next part, I don't know if you've ever realized this or not. We talked about it again in our study of Daniel. But in verse, let's see here, verse 25, I'm sorry, verse 28. The hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth all who are in the graves. I think a lot of times in churches, we talk about if you want everlasting life, become a Christian, then you'll have everlasting life. Well, believe it or not, everybody has everlasting life. They're just two different kinds of life. There are two types of resurrection that he talks about in this verse of verse 28. I mean, sorry, verse 29. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. Those who have accepted Christ, they, resurrection of life. Those who have done evil, who deny Christ, the resurrection of condemnation. We will all have resurrection bodies that can experience eternity. These ones can't. These are tents. These are shells that exist only while we walk here on earth. But every single human being, when they take their last breath, they do not cease to exist. Their body ceases to function. They're no longer physically with us, but they don't cease to exist. And in the last day, every single person who has ever died will hear his voice and return to life. Now, this particular section is talking about, we've talked about it in Daniel. So there's the, there's the rapture. We return to heaven. Tribulation happens here on earth for seven years. Then Jesus returns and sets up his millennial kingdom, a thousand year reign here on earth with us reigning with him. And all those who are raptured, there are going to be people who come to a saving knowledge of Christ. And there are going to be people who are going to reject him, even though he's here ruling on earth. They will still have free will. They will still have the opportunity to choose during that thousand year reign. That's for anybody who's left over after the tribulation ends. So that thousand year reign, that's when this, this section is talking about all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. That is referring to the great white throne judgment. You might hear that term. There's so much in here, it's, it's crazy. That whole great white throne judgment thing that's talked about in Revelation, it's referred to in Daniel. We talked about it during our Daniel lessons, uh, our Daniel study this past summer. But you can read all that. But Jesus is telling them everything that's going to happen. They don't have the book of Revelations yet when he's speaking this. They, they don't. But Jesus is telling them about it right here. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous because I don't seek my own will but the Father who sent me. The will of the Father who sent me. Once again, Jesus is claiming and he's telling them, I and the Father are one. The Father is God, so am I. I'm the Son of God, but I'm also the Son of Man. So he claims he is equal with God in these ways. They do the same things. They have the same power. They have the same right to judge us, and they deserve honor and praise. So they're the same. Jesus, the Son, and God the Father are the same in all four of those ways. And Jesus just outlined it all here. So now it comes time for him to call his witnesses. If you're familiar with Deuteronomy, let me just pull it up real quick here. Deuteronomy 17.6 talks about, and these scribes would have known this text. The law in Deuteronomy stated that you needed to have two or three witnesses in order to condemn someone. So Jesus brings his three witnesses. Who's the first witness? Well, the first witness that he calls to the stand is John the Baptist. What did John say? What did John the Baptist say when he saw Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And Jesus says, but I don't really need a man to exonerate me, to 
bear witness that we, but when Jesus was baptized, the Father himself, a voice from the heavens, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So the Father testified that this was his Son. So witness number one is John the Baptist. And Jesus is like, you guys, you're pretty thrilled about him for a while. Even the Jewish leadership, like John the Baptist, he's calling people to repentance. He's a little wacky, he's a little weird, but he's an okay dude. Even though he's creepy John, he's calling the people to repentance. And they didn't have a problem with him until he started calling them out on their sins and then they killed him. So we have John the Baptist as witness number one. The second witness, Jesus says, are the works that he does. They're the very works that he does. And he talks about, you know, the work that he had just done. Imagine that. He had just healed some guy who had been paralyzed for 38 years and told him to rise, pick up his bed, and walk. And Jesus is like, you're giving me grief because I did that on the Sabbath, but I did it because my father told me to. So who are you to tell me what to do, basically? So the second witness, first witness is John the Baptist. The second witness are the very signs and wonders that Jesus did while he was here. And he did lots of them. There are, I think I read somewhere, there are 30 different miracles that were reported across the four Gospels. I think John talks about seven of them, maybe nine, I forget. But that, those are just the ones that they wrote down. There's another place where it says, if John says towards the end, if all of the things that he did were written down, there's there's no book, no, no amount of paper, no amount of parchment or animal skins or whatever you want to type on or write on could hold it because there's, it's too vast. But the signs and wonders that Jesus performed bore witness that he was the Son of God, that he was who he said he was, and he gives honor to the Father when he does them. Thank you, Father. I know that you hear me. I know you always hear me, but I'm saying this so that those around me can know that you sent me. That was one of Jesus's prayers before one of his miracles. So witness number two is the signs and wonders. Witness number three is actually the thing that should have convinced the scribes and Pharisees from the get-go, and that was the scriptures. Even if all they read were the first five books, the Pentateuch, Moses, it's believed that Moses wrote all those. Obviously he wasn't here, but he was inspired to write them and he was told what to write. The writings of Moses actually foretold about Jesus. And Jesus says, you know, you believe in Moses. Moses wrote about me. How did you miss that? And I got to wondering, well, hmm, what are some of the things that Moses wrote about that foretold who Jesus was? Foretold, and I'm talking about messianic prophecies. It starts back in Genesis, believe it or not. I've mentioned this before, but I've learned a couple of new things about this. So in Genesis 3, 14 through 15, after Adam and Eve have sinned, and Eve says, that serpent, he's the one who made me do it. The devil made me do it. That's where the whole thing came from. Toward, in verse 15, God tells the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head or crush your head and you shall bruise his heel. Something I'd never thought about before that I learned this week. And actually in the New King James Version, when that line that says between your seed, meaning the serpent seed, and her seed, that word seed is capitalized. When you read in the Old Testament about procreation, the seed is always described as what the male brings to the party. The seed of conception comes from the man. But in this case, God is telling Satan that the woman is going to have a seed. That right there is the immaculate conception. That is the miracle of a virgin birth. She did not know a man, so she didn't have the seed that is talked about any time procreation is discussed in the scriptures. That is a prophetic telling of the virgin birth. And then the next part, he will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. This says bruise your head, but other translations say crush. When you think about if you were walking along 
in the woods and you came across a poisonous snake, where's the most likely place that you're going to get bit? Probably down around your heels or ankles if you're walking past them. So the, the image that I have in my head for this, for this particular little section is a venomous snake bites someone on the heel and that person turns around and stomps on the snake's head. What's the end result? Both parties will die. This is the prophetic utterance of the fact that Christ, the Messiah, is going to suffer and die. But in the process of that suffering and dying, he crushes the serpent. He puts an end to that death. Isn't that cool? So that's all the way back in Genesis. I'm only going to give three examples here because we're going to run out of time. But the second example of how Moses testified, you know, we read, let me, let me back up a second. You're probably all familiar with the story about the road to Emmaus. After Jesus had resurrected, so this is, we're talking Easter weekend, after Jesus resurrected and appeared to the disciples, there were two dudes on their way to Emmaus, strolling down the road, and Jesus joins them. I'm just going to read this one, one section. So they talked together about, they were talking about all the things that had happened. They were talking about the fact that Jesus was killed, and the disciples now said his body is missing, and oh, woe is me, what are we going to do? Jesus drew near and went with them, but their eyes were restrained, so they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you were having with one another as you walk, and why are you sad? And they looked at him and was like, are you the only one? Are you a stranger in town? Are you the only one in Jerusalem that you don't know the things that have happened in these past few days? <laughs> and Jesus' response is classic. Things? What things? <laughs> And so they told him the things that had happened. And in this passage, I'm not going to read it all, but Jesus said, you knew this was going to happen. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory? Verse 27 of Luke 24. At the, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. I love that story. Wouldn't you have loved to have been there? And why didn't Luke record what that conversation was? Well, it wasn't, maybe it wasn't revealed to him. Maybe the Spirit wanted us to figure that out. So I went on to search and seizure, and that's how I came up with a few of these. There's probably tons more. So the first one was the whole um, bruising the heel and crushing the head of the serpent. The second one, think about the Passover. When the Jews were slaves in Egypt and Moses was working on Pharaoh with God doing the, the plagues to get them out of Egypt. The very last plague was the death of the firstborn. And in order for anyone to escape this angel of death who was going to kill the firstborn of every creature, men and animals, the way that they would escape that death was to find a spotless lamb. They were bringing it to their home so they could observe it for a couple of days and make sure that it really was a perfect plan. And on the night when the angel was to come, they were to slaughter that lamb, but they had to do it a very specific way. They were not allowed to break any of the lamb's bones. Once they slaughtered that lamb, they were given instructions on how to cook it and how to eat it and what to do with any leftovers. But the most important part was they were to take the blood of that lamb and spread it on the doorposts and the lintel of their homes. The doorposts and the lintel. What does that shape make? The blood of the spotless lamb that was slain was the thing that preserved them and allowed them to spare their firstborn from the angel of death. Every, there's so much imagery and, and foretelling in the whole Passover story even as it's, as it's celebrated today. We've talked about, when a, if you've ever had a chance to participate in a Seder, or if you ever get a chance, please do it, or even just research all of the, the, all of the pieces and nuances of what is part of that ceremony. That was a picture of Christ, the perfect lamb. Jesus was the only one of the three crucified that day. 
who didn't have a bone broken. There were two thieves, one on either side of him. Jesus died at the very moment when the Passover lambs for that Passover were being slaughtered. He died. He gave up his life. It was getting late in the day, and the soldiers didn't want to, they, did, they couldn't leave them on the cross, basically. So they would come and they would break the legs of those who were on the cross, who were being crucified. If they hadn't died yet, they would break their legs and then they would suffocate. The prisoners, those being crucified, would suffocate. So they broke the two thieves' legs. When they got to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. So they never broke his legs. He had no bone broken. He was the perfect, spot, per perfect spotless lamb. But just to make sure he was dead, a soldier pierced his side with a sword or a spear, and blood and water flowed out, piercing the pericardial sac and proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was, in fact, dead. So that's the second, is the whole Passover, the Lamb, the Lamb of God. And then the third one, we've talked about the bronze serpent. And in John 3, 16, Jesus used this same example when he was talking to Nicodemus, who was also a Pharisee, just as the bronze serpent was lifted up by Moses in the wilderness, and anyone who looked upon him was saved. So will the Son of Man be lifted up. Folks, it is all through this. It's all over. So those are the witnesses that Jesus presents, and then he ends this, and he says, you do not have the love of God in you. I came in my Father's name, and you didn't receive me, but if another comes in his own name, him you will receive. Prophetic prophetic utterance of the Antichrist right there. And they, he flat out tells them, I don't have to accuse you. Moses has already taken care of that. If you believed Moses, if you really believed Moses, you would believe me because he wrote about me. But if you don't believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Folks, that's it in a nutshell. The whole kit and caboodle. I know I've gone over a minute or two, but I hope that you will, on your own, go into the Old Testament and look for places where Moses has written in those books, the first five books, about what the Messiah is going to do, what it's going to be, what it's going to be like, what's going to happen. It's sprinkled throughout. And then, of course, you have Isaiah and the Psalms. It's everywhere. But I think that's why it wasn't given to us what Jesus told these guys on the road to Emmaus because I think he wants us to find it for ourselves. And I, for one, I enjoyed that process, and I will continue it because I'm sure there are tons and tons of them. Again, I apologize for not being able to see all your comments, but um, I will reply to your comments after we're done with the live session. Um, thank you so much for coming tonight, and I hope you learned something in this in this session. I, I say it over and again, I'm amazed. Every time I read, I learn something new. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this time that we had together. Thank you for the rich depth of the truths in your word, for this one section of scripture where there were so many nuggets of truth and information about you and, and how we can know beyond the shadow of a doubt that Jesus was and is, in fact, the Son of God and the Son of Man. Thank you, Lord, for sending your Son. Thank you, Jesus, for coming. And providing the sacrifice for us that we could never provide. Lord, thank you for your word and the richness that it gives us. Thank you for this time that we have together that we can share together and learn together. And I just ask that you would go with each and every person here tonight and anyone listening to the recording later, that you would bless them, bless their socks off. <laughs> Help them to understand your words, to have a hunger and a thirst for knowledge of you so that they can know you better and become more like you, so that I can know you better and become more like you. And I thank you for this opportunity, for it's in the Son's name, Jesus Yeshua, that I pray. Amen. I hope you all have a great week ahead and that you study for yourself and learn something new. Take care and God bless.